Coming up, you cannot have successful business development without access to lending. Shannon Metatawaben is on a mission to improve access to finance for Aboriginal communities. Welcome to this Raw Talk special. Shannon, welcome to this Raw Talk special. I want to start with a simple but very important question. That is, what does economic reconciliation mean to you? Uh, economic reconciliation has, uh, has not been talked about much. Uh, there's a lot of areas of reconciliation that need to happen in Canada with the Indigenous people and uh, economic reconciliation for me means bringing the wealth back to the community. Uh, prior to contact, Indigenous people were very wealthy. We had access to our resources, we had access to our lands, our people uh, migrated and, and did lots of trade. Um, and so we were very wealthy, but with contact, we're put into our current uh, situation of uh, poverty. And so bringing that wealth back to the community with, uh, br with today's day and age uh, is what I think uh, economic reconciliation is. Why do you think that economic reconciliation has not been talked about that much? Well, uh, Indigenous people have a, a lot of barriers put up against them and uh, uh, we're probably the only uh, culture in the whole world that has a policy called the Indian Act uh, that was uh, instituted uh, for us specifically. Uh, it makes us wards of the state, uh, so we weren't allowed to do many things. We weren't allowed to advocate for, our for ourselves and, and create uh, any sort of wealth. Uh, anytime there was uh, a, an attempt at creating wealth, there was a roadblock put in front of us. Uh, economic reconciliation um, seems to be the lowest priority in government and even in, in the indigenous communities uh, priority list. Our communities are experiencing high rates of poverty, low education, social issues. That seems to be uh, the focus. But um, I've, uh, for the past 30 years, I've always been the believer that you can, you can look at all the priorities but then leave a little room for economic development because you've got to start chipping away at creating wealth for the community to ensure that you're, you're slowly bringing down that mountain of, uh, of, uh, of issues in the community. You call yourself an economic development empowerment or it's a very intriguing title. What does it mean to you? Well, for 30 years I've been uh, assisting our community um, look at economic development as, as a way to, to get out of the social trap that uh, the communities were put in with the Indian Act and the reservation system. And by, by looking at the opportunities outside the communities, within the communities, within the tribal systems, uh, looking at all opportunities to take advantage of the resources around us to look at wealth creation. I've assisted about 250 businesses when I was working directly in economic development. Now I'm holding the highest uh, position in uh, financial institutions with the N National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association. So I want to try to affect change with policy, access to capital, in all areas that we need to bring focus to economic development. Something that you have said is that in the 80s the Aboriginal cause was on the right track. Um, but it seems to me that you don't longer feel that that is the case. Why is that? Well, back in, in the 80s when they first established the Aboriginal Financial Institution Network, uh, they started that with $240 million in government funding and they turned it into $2.3 in lending in the last 30 years. But I said that they were on the right track because they initiated something that would benefit Indigenous people in, in looking at creating wealth by encouraging business. But since the 80s to now, they've reduced funding for economic development by 50 to 70 percent. So it's been on the, dr uh, the downward track for supporting a community that's growing four times faster than the Canadian population. So do you feel that the government hasn't delivered really on its promise to reconcile? I don't, do think they've, I don't think they've really promised to reconcile economic development. We really need to put it on their radar that this is a good opportunity for them to save in the long term by investing now so that a community of people will build their own wealth so that they can take care of themselves in the future. It's all about sustainability. Everything that I've done in my life is all about creating sustainability. Do you think that the current discussion about economic reconciliation can get it on the right track? I think that with bringing to focus economic development 
as a priority, I think that will start to develop some interest, some understanding that this is a good idea. You invest uh, now into this culture, we create wealth so that we're more successful in the future. And if you look all, across, all around the world, every culture has been successful because they have access to capital. Indigenous people in Canada still don't have access to capital and that's what I want to raise as as a priority. And let's look at that. Let's look at access to finance and access to capital. Why is it that Aboriginal business community does not have the same access to capital as the non-Indigenous businesses? We have to look at why Indigenous people are looked at differently than any other Canadian. We're essentially put into res reservations and forgotten about. We are uh, given a piece of policy from the government called the Indian Act that dictates our lives, puts us onto reservations. This, uh, an apartheid system that separates us from the rest of society and then uh, the policy doesn't allow banks to take any security so nobody wants to to invest in indigenous people because they can't take security that's one of the barriers but our proximity to the markets and uh, and a number of other barriers prevents economic development from really taking place but if we provide access to capital, we have many Indigenous people that are ready to start businesses and they will be very successful because 200 plus court cases that are in favour of Indigenous people's right and to, to, to territories and their lands um, is, is making Corporate Canada take a serious look at Indigenous people, building relationships, getting part way down the, uh, the consent uh, track. What is the difference between Aboriginal financial institutions and mainstream lenders? Well, Aboriginal financial institutions develop deep social networks within the areas that they provide their lending assistance. They have close relationships with the leadership in the communities. They have close relationships with the families in each community. And they have a specific area that they provide that lending assistance to. So they, they, they've watched children grow and develop into entrepreneurs. So they're growing entrepreneurs and developing that, that, uh, that uh, culture of this is, this is an option for people. So they really develop some good social relations. They make great decisions, 95% repayment rates, you know, some of the highest in the world because of that relationship that they have with the people. And you mentioned it, uh, Aboriginal businesses are growing, they're getting bigger, they're getting more complex, and the demand is actually outgrowing what the AFIs can provide. Why is this? Well, like any culture, we're, we're understanding business, we're, we're, we're developing relationships internationally. Indigenous people around the world are starting to connect. So we're seeing opportunities all over the world. And I think uh, with the right access to capital, the right capacity and the institutions in place to support Indigenous businesses, we can actually participate in a global scale more meaningfully. But ultimately, the goal must be that Aboriginal businesses have the same access to mainstream financing as the non-Aboriginal businesses. I think if you looked in the 90s, uh, the Indigenous market probably wasn't something that uh, mainstream lending was taken a hard look at. It was high risk and so they, they developed a developmental lending institution like, uh, like the 58 that we have. But uh, now they're looking at it as a real opportunity. There's going to be 2.5 million indigenous people in the next 15 years, a million indigenous youth by 2027. This is a real growth area, four times uh, population growth than, uh, than the, the Canadian uh, population growth. Uh, GDP has the potential to be a hundred billion dollars a year. So we have nothing but ups, we're growing, we have an ability to contribute to, to the GDP and I think this is something that everybody should take a good hard look at. And I want to finish off where we started with economic reconciliation and ask you what role do you see access to finance has in the broader economic reconciliation agenda? I think no society in the world has been successful without access to capital. If you have access to capital, you can create an infrastructure for yourselves. You can create housing, you can educate your people, you can have healthy people and then they can in turn think about business rather than surviving every day. Shannon, thank you very much for joining this Raw Talk special. Thank you very much.